Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today, I am standing right at Treeline here in beautiful Colorado, among the highest trees that grow in the Rocky Mountains. Behind me, specifically, is a small forest of bristlecone pines. These trees are some of the oldest trees in the world. Many of these individual trees, uh, some of which have died and many of which are still alive, are thousands of years old older in some cases than the pyramids of Egypt. Now, scientists know that by means of studying, uh, uh, <laughs> fill in the blank, right? I'm not a botanist, but I assume that uh, tree rings, I assume cellular composition, I assume, you know, botanists have their means of determining this, um, this fairly well-known fact about bristlecone pines. Well, I'm not a botanist, and I can't exactly tell you how people know that these trees are older than you know, any other tree that you might look at. But I can tell you about how we know or can speculate intelligently that certain poems in Old Norse written down in the 1200s actually originate from an earlier period. Now to begin with, we can never be 100% certain that archaic language, more archaic language than we expect in a given poem, isn't inserted there consciously as an attempt to make it look older. After all, people do this today. Just take a look at certain translations of the Poetic Edda. Many of them, such as those by Lee Hollander and Henry Adams Bellows, are consciously written in imitation of much earlier, more archaic English than those men actually spoke. So it is possible for people to take the language of an earlier time and imitate it. However, this is perhaps less likely in contexts where the actual poetry is interfered with by having more archaic characteristics than the language of the time that it is written down. I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. So what are some characteristics we're going to look for as far as establishing more archaic language than the time at which a poem is actually written down? To a certain extent, word order is something we can look for. The poems of the Poetic Edda, particularly something like Hobbamal or Vav Through the Small, have word order that is divergent in odd ways from the already fairly loose word order rules of Old Norse poetry. Particularly in Hobbamal, you see things like verb first. The very famous stanzas 76 and 77 have doir fe, doia frander, die cattle, die kinsmen which is extremely unusual, uh, even in Old Norse where word order is fairly free in poetry. You also see a fair amount of verb final lines in the um, uh, older poems, the Poetic Edda, which while not as unusual, uh, the very prevalence of it seems to be pretty archaic. There's also the question of hapax legomena, that means words that occur one time. If a word occurs nowhere else, in Old Norse literature, it tells us something, right? It doesn't necessarily tell us that the poem in which that word occurs is archaic, but it tells us that it is otherwise somehow isolated because we do have a very large corpus of Old Norse. It's not a uh, language like Gothic where we have, you know, a Bible translation, not much else. In Old Norse, we have lots and lots and lots. So if a word only occurs one time, there's something going on. It may be archaic, it may be a regionalism, it may be that the author is consciously inventing words, but a lot of hopox legomena, a lot of words that occur only one time in a given text, such as we have in a poem like Atlakvida in the Poetic Edda, may be strong indications that that poem is actually from a much earlier period. Now, another poem that actually has a lot of uh, hopox legomena actually is Havamal, but for that matter, so does Atlamal, which is a poem we otherwise assume is quite late, but composed by someone from Greenland. So those hapax legomena may, as I said, actually re reflect uh, regionalisms rather than archaisms. So you have to be careful about that. Then there's the filler words. There's a widespread notion that of is an earlier form of the filler word or the preposition meaning just something like about or over than um. And so a lot of times if you look at early editions of 
the poems of the Poetic Edda and Old Norse, which are the, usually the ones that are also copied online because they're public domain. You'll see that all of the places where the word womb actually occurs in the text are replaced by wolf. This is one of the things people complain about when they see my Old Norse text because they say, well, you know, I found it on whatever.com with all of these, these oves where you have ooms. I'm actually letting the manuscripts oves and ooms shine through, whereas people trying to make the text look more archaic are replacing the ooms with oves. We're actually not that sure that uh, ove is that much earlier than oom, but one thing that these oves and ooms can be useful for dating is that it seems like the use of them as just metrical filler words, right, they're just put in there when we need an unstressed syllable and nothing else, they don't actually have meaning, they're not actually a word to be translated. The use of the filler word goes down over time. So that poems with more use of any filler word, ove or oom, are probably more archaic. So, Havamal has a ton of the filler words, especially if you exclude Lodfofni small, a portion that has, has less of it. As do Thrimskvida, Oldrunar Grotter, Vavthrutni small, Sigurdrivumal, Gudrunar Kvida 1, and Voluspa. Poems that are very little include all the Helgi poems, uh, Gripispo, Horvarsljod, Vopni small, Atlakvida, which is strange because Atlakvida has a ton of other archaic characteristics, Gudrunar Kvida 2 and 3, Regensmal, and Helraid Brenhildar. One of the characteristics that's actually most diagnostic, I think, is alliteration with V on words that originally started with V R. So this includes especially words from the root reid, meaning angry, which is earlier freid, and words meaning to. Well, this actually has a lot of different meanings. It's, it's related to English rec, but it often means fight in the poems of the Borgera. Rec, which is earlier frek. Now in East Norse, that V never disappears. You still see, for instance, uh, Vled and Vlak, for instance, in, uh, in East Scandinavian today, in Swedish and Danish. But those disappear probably by about 1,000 based on alliteration in skaldic poems in Old West Norse, that is, the classical Old Norse in which the poems of the Poetic Edda are written down, the language that's ancestral to Icelandic Faroese and Norwegian dialects. So when we find places where the scribe of the manuscript has written those words with an R, but they clearly, based on the poetry, need to alliterate with a V. That may be a good indication. I think it's one of the best indications that a poem is actually uh, from before the time when that VR became R in Old West Norse. Some examples of that would be Hovamal, stanza 32, line 3, in at virdi rekas, we would expect frekas. Vav through the small. Stanza 53, line 3, Thesmun Vidar Reka. We would expect Thesmun Vidar Vreka. Loka Senna, Stanza 13, lines 4 to 5, Vegathu Gak Evthreither Ser. We would expect Vegathu Gak Evthreither Ser. Fawfness Mall, Stanza 30, line 3, Hors Reither Skulu Vega. We would expect Hors Reither Skulu Vega. And Atlakvida, Stanza 2, lines 3 to 4, Vin i Valholu, Reidi Sosk Ther Huna. We would expect Vin i Valholu, Freidi Sosk Ther Huna. And all of those poems just mentioned that have this alliteration, Hov Mal Vasin Small, Locus and Hov Small, and Alakvida can, on other grounds, be assumed to be quite old. Now, if you want to read quite a bit about the uh, ideas about how to date Eddic poetry, there's a good book on the subject that's called The Dating of Eddic Poetry by Bjarna. Fittistu, uh, the late Bjarna Fittistu. One possible criterion he discusses that I believe was originally raised by Adolf Norain that's kind of interesting is this, and it's based on a metrical consideration. In the Ljodahotra meter, which I've discussed in a separate video, link in a card in the top right, the C line, right, the line three or six or nine, can't end in a two-syllable word with a metrically heavy first syllable. This is one reason why Hovamal stands at 107 line 6 and needs to be amended because it says O Alda Ves Yagna. This not only doesn't make sense grammatically, because we have three genitives on men's holy places, earths, but that Yard cannot be an acceptable uh, 
second to last syllable in a Leo the Halter C line because it's metrically heavy. It has, uh, it ends in either two consonants or it has a vowel that's long or a diphthong. Now, most C lines must postdate apocope. All right, now apocope in Old Norse is what happens when you lose the weakly stressed second, sometimes third syllables in a word when they umlaut the preceding stressed vowel in a given word. So stanza 69, line three of Hovamal must come from after apocope, and apocope is a process of the 700s, maybe into the early 800s. Sumer era of sonum sal, because sal would earlier have been salis, and that would not work because the long a in the first syllable of salis wouldn't be an acceptable second to last syllable in a C line of the oath halter. But what does it mean if a stanza would not violate this rule? Maybe not very much because, of course, just by coincidence, a lot of given stanzas would still work in Proto Norse too before apocope and umlaut. But if an entire poem would work by this rule in Proto Norse, if you see what I'm saying, if you if you change the that's all those C lines into Proto Norse and you still never get a violation of this rule, then it's just possible, of course, who knows, but it's just possible that those lines at least predate apocope and umlaut. Adolf Norain tested this and found that for skirnis or skirnis mall and vavthrudnis mall largely still worked with uh, the, the conversion of Proto Norse. And a large part of Gesta Thothr, the first part of Halvamal, works too. So just possibly those would be uh, candidates for um, transmission from an even earlier time before one of the most signature sound changes of Old Norse. And if you want more information about Umlaut and Apocope and Breaking, I also have a video about that that I'll link in a card in the top right. So I hope this has given you some idea of how uh, linguists and philologists, such as there's a difference anymore, uh, such as philologists exist anymore, uh, maybe even I'm extinct, uh, we, how we go about saying, you know, maybe this poem is actually older than the uh, paper, or rather the calfskin, that it's written down on. I hope that you'll check out my translation of Hovamal that's included in the Wanderer's Hovamal that also has the facing page of Old Norse text for you to compare and consider. It also has a commentary by me on the Old Norse uh, in, uh, in English that takes up uh, quite a bit of space and addresses many of the most common questions people have about Hovamal or about the language in which it's written. I hope that you'll check out also some of my other videos in this channel, and that if you enjoy these videos that I make in beautiful places in my Rocky Mountain homeland of Colorado and Wyoming, that you'll consider supporting me via Patreon. For now, from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best. <laughs>